Good afternoon. You know, today is a day that most of us will never forget. Uh, a day when many in our community thought that our worst nightmares might actually be happening. A day when many frantically tried to think about the things that they would do if uh, a ballistic missile launch would happen. You know, I know firsthand that what happened today was totally unacceptable and many in our community was deeply affected by this and I'm sorry for that pain and confusion that anyone might have experienced. You know, I'm too very angry and disappointed that this happened. Um, we are doing everything that we can immediately to ensure that it never happens again. You know, we have spent the morning with General Logan, Vern Miyagi, and those involved with uh, emergency management and their teams. And I've directed them to make the changes necessary to ensure that a false alarm will not happen. Um, we are working to evaluate everything in the sequence of today's activities uh, to make sure that we are prepared and the procedures are changed so that a single person will not be able to make an error that triggers uh, another false alarm. Uh, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Vern Miyagi um, to go through today's events. Uh, I'm Vern Miyagi, the Administrator of Hawaii Emergency Management Agency. Uh, I deeply apologize for the trouble and a heartbreak that we caused today. You know, we've spent the last few months trying to get ahead of this whole threat so that we could provide as much notification and preparation time to the public. Uh, today was something that we, I regret because I accept responsibility for this. This is my team. We made a mistake. Uh, we we're going to take processes and, and study this so that this doesn't happen again. Uh, let me go over. You, you were distributed today a, a press release, I believe, hard copy. There's a timeline in there. I'd like to spend a few minutes just going over that timeline. At 0805 this morning, our state warning point, which is my 24-7 operation group, uh, did a change of shift preparation. And at the end of each, the new incoming shift will do a, a, a check or a test of the ballistic missile uh, preparation checklist. So at 0805, uh, this test uh, started. At, zero eight, at 0807 is when the trigger is pulled uh, on the test. The wrong button was pushed on this test. It went into an actual event versus a test. At 8.10 a.m., we of course got messages on our wireless remote system, the uh, tele telephones and so on, and calls that this had gone out. And at that point in time, uh, we started the recall or the cancellation process. At 8.13 a.m., State Warning Point issued a cancellation of the civil danger warning message. And what this does is prevent any more messages going out. It doesn't issue a separate message canceling it. It just stops the messages from going out. At 8.20 a.m., Hawaii Emergency Management Agency issued a public notification of cancellation uh, on the Facebook and Twitter. At 8.24 a.m., Governor Ige retweet, retweets our message of the cancellation notice. At 8.30 a.m., Governor posts the cancellation notification on the Facebook page. And at 8.45 a.m., after getting authorization from FEMA's uh, IPAWS Integrated Public Alert and Warning System, HIEM issued a civil emergency message that verbally alerted people that this was not, this was a, a missile was not incoming and this was a false alarm. And that's where we were as the end of today. As far as the way ahead, 
I have to emphasize that this is what has been happening over the last few months is our focus has been getting the notification out to the public. One thing that we have to work on more is the cancellation notice in, in this event. Our focus now, of course, is not to have any more false alarms going out. And by doing this, we're working on procedures that have already been implemented. The first of all, the governor, the, the governor has directed that we hold off any more tests until we get this squared away. What has already put, been put in place is a two-person rule that during a drill, there will always be two people there before the, the, the button is pushed for both drills and for the uh, actual other. The other point is the cancellation message. We will have a, a cancellation template that's already been inserted whereby the cancellation message already prescripted will go out and say that this is a false alarm and there's no missile inbound. I have to emphasize that uh, at 8, 8, 10 a.m., right after this went out, General Logan called Pacific Command to confirm that there was no missile inbound. And that was our priority for us to make sure that that word got out. The other thing that we need to do is expanding the notification protocol so all of the, governor, the, the governors, the mayors, the counties all understand that this is a false alarm. It is, we, we need to make more contacts uh, to notify that this was a false alarm. The other point is contact with the press and the media to make sure this goes out right away also. Again, I apologize for this. This is my responsibility and my team. But please keep in mind that, again, the threat is there. If this comes out, you're going to have only about 12 to 13 minutes of warning for an actual event. And please take this to heart. Again, I apologize for what's happened. Aloha, good afternoon, everyone. My name is George Segetti. I'm the CEO for the Hawaii Tourism Authority. Obviously, this is a, a day we'll never forget. Um, like everyone else, we're extremely concerned that this happened. Um, but we're also encouraged, and I'm very encouraged, that, that we'll have all of the key decision makers and agencies now coming together, having serious dialogue to ensure that this never, ever happens again. Upon hearing uh, the notice, we immediately reached out to airports, harbors, our 10 global partners. And in many instances, because of the time difference, we were able to message very quickly that this was a false alarm and uh, hopefully mitigate any, any uh, potential damage there. We spoke to uh, all of our island chapters, our industry stakeholders, obviously very, very concerned, and we assured them that, uh, that there were, as I mentioned earlier, that there will be very serious dialogue between all the decision makers and agencies to ensure it doesn't happen again. The important thing, I think, is that for us, the health, safety, and welfare of our visitors and our residents alike is always, always top priority. And we're gonna do everything that we can ensure that that is there. And then the message I would like to be very clear when in speaking to our global partners is that Hawaii is open for business, is still perceived as the most safe, clean, welcoming destination in the world. And I'm confident we'll continue that message. Thank you. Uh, with that, we open it up to your questions. Governor, never say never. Uh, in a day of technology where you can do it live, why rely on canned audio notifications? You know, I think we uh, have a combination. The notification process is uh, a variety of different mechanisms. We have the sirens. You know, we have uh, cell phones today. We have uh, internet and social media. Uh, mechanisms. We do know that we need to be able to broadcast messages across all platforms uh, and certainly that's what the intention was. Um, you know there was no automated way to send a false alarm um, cancellation. Uh, we had to initiate a uh, manual process uh, and that um, was why it took a while to, to notify everyone. So Isn't there a way to connect it to when you have when you have such things as Nixle alerts, where 
it could come out that fast, much faster. Wouldn't that be a better option? Well, certainly we will be looking at, we've already implemented some actions to speed the process so that um, the public would be notified faster. But we are evaluating uh, all of the processes that we currently have to ensure that we can provide the um, notice to the public as soon as possible. So to clarify, the 38 minutes that transpired between the initial alert going out and the false alarm notification was the result of the time that you guys needed to manually take control no. of the system? Well, it's a couple things. If, if you look at the timeline, certainly we had sent notification uh, that it was a false alarm much earlier than the 38 minutes. Right. The 38 minute interval is really the interval that we had to manually go through the process to provide uh, notification on the smartphones and cell phones. Um, we did have other notification that occurred much, much sooner than that. Right, on but Twitter and on Facebook, but not everyone is plugged into these social media platforms. Right. They rely on these mass notifications via mobile devices or the sirens, which in some cases did go off in certain communities. Yes, the sirens was uh, separate. And a few of them went off, but uh, most of them did not because they're not involved with this um, test. So the, cl the clarification then is why were those sirens triggered yeah. when you guys were already issuing a correction that it was a false alarm? Well, we have to check on that. That's why we do the monthly test. But the, the, the drill that was done this morning was only for the emergency alert system, which is a TV radio, and then the, the wireless emergency alert system, which is your cell phones. Is the real alert supposed to work then where you, you would get this notification and then are the sirens supposed to that, go after that's that? That's correct, but because this is an in internal test, a drill, we don't want the, the sirens to go off publicly. So why did the sirens go we off? We have to review that. We have to test. But again, it's an internal drill, so the sirens are not supposed to go off outside. This is just to make sure the warning point personnel know exactly what process to, to follow to initiate if this was a real event. And if there's a, a situation, you're saying it was the wrong button was pushed. Yes. I guess give us a little clear. So there are buttons on a panel. It one is person pushes a certain button, and there's no uh, uh, sort of a, a safety guard where it is. Are you sure you want to push that button? The, the, it's a screen. It's more like a, a mouse click. It is a screen, a test button, and, and an actual. Okay, the wrong button was passed. Well, was once pushed. that button is pushed, that's it. It goes that's through. It. That's correct. There's no sort of redundancy whatsoever. I was going to say that the, the old process was no redundancy. We've implemented changes already to assure that it becomes a redundant process so that it won't be a single individual. There will be at, at least two people that would be uh, involved to, to in initiate the alert. You mean since this morning you've implemented that? Yes, that's correct. that's correct. So to clarify, with a mouse click, someone sent out this mass alert saying that this is not a drill, shelter in place immediately, and by the time the next alert went out to the masses and those 38 minutes has passed, you guys had obviously already clarified that it was a false alarm, yes. but that's there correct. were still sirens that had started going off, and you're saying that that's on a separate system. So who made the call to initiate or authorize the use of the sirens? No one had authorized the use of the siren. So, so the siren should not, and we don't know, but we will find out. What is the procedure? Can you walk us through the steps of what is the procedure when you're testing? Well, the, the procedure for the test is that in a real event, we will get notification from your specific command. And then we'll go to the test as far as uh, activating the, the computer screen and the program as far as it, that would activate the, the warnings and the alerts. So the process of our test is that we simulate a notification from PACOM. Now again, no notification from PACOM came. We simulate that. And based on that simulation, uh, our staff at the state warning point will open up the screen, go through the checklist, and then make that initiation. That's what. There, oh, there, there is a, again, it's a human error. There is, there is a screen that says, are you, are you sure you want to do this? Okay, again, that's already in place. Now, we had w one person, human error, and that thing was, was pushed anyway. So, okay. Vern, so, uh, there so was they not only triggered the alert, they also pressed yes? Yes. There was a two-step process, yeah, there and is they a pressed yes in both situations. Right. So <laughs> by, by having redundancy, having two people, you've got 12 to 13 minutes to alert the public. How much of a delay will this just, just, person... Just, there would be no delay in this case. We would have, so right now, the process 
That's, the process would be the OTS or the person in charge of the warning point at that shift would be the one to either push it or oversee to make sure that there's two people there when you push the button. Did I'm you sorry get to an clarify, there then? was a redundancy in place then. Someone clicks to send out this mass message yes. and then someone also clicked to say yes. It's this the same, it's the same person. Did he explain why then he he did I, it twice, basically. I, I can't explain that. That's Like I said, it's a human error that we're going to fix. We understand it's a mistake, but what are the consequences as the result of the kind of just mass hysteria and confusion that was launched this morning as a result of a human error? What's the consequence? The consequence of this is obviously bad. Uh, I'm working on credibility now because we've worked so hard to get this in place. That's why I want to tell the public right now is, again, this was a mistake on our part. But don't let that stop as far as the preparation and the warning time if this happens for real. So in, in my case, you know, you watch the news right now, they're talking. Kim Jong-un is talking to the South, so that the tensions are going, are getting better. So when I heard this this morning, I thought this has got to be a false alarm because that's not happening. And our outreach to the public and our training is, again, keep, it, keep informed of what's going on in the, in the, the tension between the two countries and keep uh, you monitor uh, that. So again, when I saw this today, when I heard this today, I thought something was wrong. It was a false alarm, mainly because the tensions were not there to, to start something like this. Again, that, that's, again, we should, this should not have happened, and we're going to work hard to make sure we, this is not going to happen again, as the governor said. And we're going to work the cancellation process and the notification process to be much better so this doesn't grow to what we went through this morning. Did you well, guys not individual have consequences? The individual who is responsible, will they have uh, consequences? Well, the, the consequences is that they'll be, of course, counseled and drilled so that this never happens again. And, and to be honest, this is a shake-up here. I mean, we're not going to do this again. The people here that, that went through this will definitely not do this again because they don't want to cause all this, this heartbreak. Well, but the clarification for the counseling? Will they, will there be any sort of suspension or will be relieved of their duties because of this? Well, again, personnel issues. I'm not going to answer personnel issues. They'll be counseled and trained so that this doesn't happen again. Sorry. I mean, you got to know this guy feels bad, right? I mean, he's not doing this on purpose. It was a mistake on his part. He feels terrible about it, and it won't happen again. Has he been working here a long time? Again, another personnel. He, he's been here a while. I have another question in regards to the mass message that did go out on mobile devices. Not every carrier provided an alert. Can you clarify why that happened? Because in a real situation, everyone would need to know. I, I would say that um, uh, we hope to learn from what happened today, and that is one of the questions that we are asking. Uh, why is it that uh, some of the people didn't get the alert message on their phones? Uh, we want to understand uh, which carriers uh, delivered the message and whether all of their subscri subscribers uh, received the message. Um, same thing, so we want to be clear about um, who received the message and who didn't. Do you have a general idea of how many people received the message or how many how many, uh, we don't have that uh, right now. We are um, asking for that information from the carriers. Did it go out to all the islands? Yes. Oh, all yes. the islands? Yes. On the carrier thing, you know, certain carriers have it. So there are gaps. We're going to need to identify what carriers don't have it, talk to them, and make sure that it, it gets on. And that's, that's to do. Can you talk about what you want people to know in re with regard to being able to gain their trust in the system? Uh, we want the people to know that we uh, are disappointed and angry that this happened. We do know that everyone on the island was affected in some way. Uh, we understand that. We are committed uh, to providing um, the public with a good notification system. We do understand that uh, there is a short window uh, for us to inform the public uh, and for them to respond. We would certainly encourage the public to uh, follow the, the recommendations uh, if uh, this should happen, to get inside, um, stay inside and, and get informed because um, that's what they need to do. Uh, we have already taken action to make changes to assure that this doesn't happen again. We will continue to work through that process. Uh, we will identify other um, procedures and, and opportunities that we can put into place to ensure that uh, this doesn't happen again. We're still we're still reeling from the, the Randall Saito escape which made national news and now this. 
this is going to hurt the the entire state as far as reputation. You know, certainly we uh, have, as uh, General had uh, been uh, saying, we have been balancing the interest of the public and providing a notification system in light of the world that we live in today and that there is a possibility of, of a ballistic attack. So we believe that it's in the best interest of the public to have a system of notification that we can provide notice should an event occur. It's very, very unfortunate that a false alarm was issued today, uh, and we will take action to assure that a false alarm never happens again. And you're confident that you, you, you have this sort of taken care of? Yes, absolutely. I'd like to clarify. So there is one individual who, clicking a mouse button, can send out this mass notification, and then there is a separate individual who triggers the sirens. What is the communication between those two systems so that if it were a real deal, as you mentioned, first the alert would go out, then the sirens would turn on. Mm -hmm. What's to ensure that that process is in fact, the integrity of that has been preserved? In an actual event, those two people are sitting side by side. Okay. Okay, so it'll be simultaneous. Which is why some sirens did not go off because that person knew immediately it was a mistake. I believe that could be the case, but again, I have to take a look into that. And we're, we're working on a written report on this uh, as far as what happened, uh, what the fixes are going to be, and the way ahead is going to be. One of the challenges as a member of the media is that we did not have access to information right away. So what procedures, what policies will now change as people turn immediately to the internet, turn their TVs on, put on the radio to try to get credible, clear information? The process is again, getting that cancellation notice out as soon as possible with that, with the new template that we have in there. And then again, for a false alarm, we have to make sure that we have clear lines to the media, all the stations, through our public information people to get that simultaneously out. So that has to be worked and tested again. You've, you've talked about the challenge of getting that, that second manual um, alert drafted and, and pushed out. Had it not, had this scenario that a false alarm could potentially have gone out and that you would need to have a quick turnaround with another push alert, had your agency not considered even this scenario, even this possibility before it happened? As far as the what, the final template that went out with the cancer, this message is a false alarm, that one, that was not put in yet. That was done outside, that was done manually. So that's going to be in. Uh, in the future. Why, you why, wasn't that, that why, you needed that? why isn't that template not there? Well, like I said, again, this is on me. Our focus was getting the notification out to the folks. As far as a false alarm, again, I did not focus on getting that template in there. I think the public is understandably sh shooken up. They understand, though, now that you're saying this was human error. But it still begs the question whether or not there was enough information about what people really should do if this, in fact, was a real ballistic missile attack. So if you could take this time now, because I know these are the questions we're sure. going to be answering over the next several days. Specifically, what do you do if you're at home, if you're on the highway, if you're in the elevator of a high-rise hotel or building? What are the steps you should immediately take? See, these are, these are very, very good questions. On our public outreach over the last few months, this is what we've been going over on and on and on. The town hall meetings, uh, uh, capital briefings and so on. Again, get inside, stay inside, and stay tuned. If you're in a, in a, every person should know ahead of time. When we say shelter in place, if something like this triggers again, if I'm at home, where do I go? If I'm driving to work, where do I go? If I'm at work, where do I go? Same, same, same all the way through. For all members of your family, so that when you take shelter in place, you don't have to worry about your, your family because you know what they're going to do. But what we put out on our website and all of our outreach and material that we have gives you an idea of what type of shelter to look for. Again, for radiation, it's always time, distance, and barriers. So get away from the radiation, get inside as far as you can, get, put, put concrete between you and the radiated area, and get inside of your building, away from glass. If you're on the highway, stop your vehicle. If you can't go any place, get, get down to the bottom of your vehicle, or get out of your vehicle if you have time, the 13 minutes, and get into a a high rise or any kind of constructed concrete building that's, that's close by. Again, planning ahead of time so you know what you're going to do ahead of time. Don't look for that shelter in place when it's inbound. The, again, I regret what happened this morning, but it brings this awareness up to speed again of what, of what to expect and what to do.
what to expect and what, and that's what we do at emergency management, is to get that information out to the public. How long have you been doing this uh, ballistic missile checklist? Okay. It started about uh, when we did the uh, the first siren test, November 1st. So they've been doing this three times a day? This is this is on a, about three times a day, but it's not it's not mandated. It's just a routine test for the new, new shifts coming on. So, but we've been doing this since about November, again, with no problems until today. Vern, could you explain again how this could possibly happen? It was one person, and and when it said, you, sh you sure you want to do this? He said yes, but now you're taking action to have two people, Correct. and they'll both get the same, um, do you still want to do this? Both of them will get that, or how will this work? The entire staff will get this. It'll be two individual people that do this. The first one that puts it in, and when it says verification, do you really want to do this? Another person will do it. Another person will say yes. Yep. Did the other person actually push the button for the, sir the physical sirens to sound? One person pushed it. Both. So one person pushed the text for it. It was the same individual for both. But they're for asking the about the sirens. The, 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 the siren is a separate thing. Again, your question about why someone up is, is, is excellent, I need to find out about that. But as I understand, there was about one or two, not the entire state. So I have to follow up on this. But yeah, it was so not initiated up here in this office. So we okay, so I'm sorry. We do really want to make sure that we clarify right. this. So we've gotten multiple reports, including video that was sent into Hawaii News Now of sirens. Sirens going off, yes. Yeah. Most of them were in proximity <coughs> of military bases. Right. We were later told that there is uh, a chance that the military may have manually triggered their own sirens. Is that? No, so we, um, if you have information about where uh, locations where sirens went off, we definitely would uh, welcome that information. We will be going through the sirens should not have gone off. It was not part of this test. The fact that some sirens were triggered uh, is information to us and we definitely want to know which sirens were triggered uh, so we can follow up about why that occurred. And again, That's to good. clarify, it's a completely different individual who would have been responsible for issuing the siren alert than the individual who pushes or clicks the mouse button to issue out the mass text message. That's correct. Okay. Will anybody Once. be retrained? Everybody be retrained on the... Uh, Everybody will go to this train. You mentioned a, uh, the three minutes in between uh, going out and the cancellation. Uh, why does it take three minutes for the for you guys to get the alert and to, to cancel the, the text? Well, this was the, you're talking about the... So it went out at 810, and you said at 813, the cancellation <coughs> and further disseminating went out. Okay. Why is there a three minute, if you just can push it and see immediately that went that it went out, why does it take three minutes to cancel? Well, it's a couple of things if you look at the timeline. We, we um, consolidated information from different individuals. So if you look at the timeline, uh, the three minute difference obviously is I got notification, uh, General <coughs> Logan got notification, so obviously he's using his um, resources to confirm, just as I am doing what I can do to confirm. Um, the people in the, in the um, alert center here have no, don't have that information. So certainly they were not aware immediately that they had uh, issued an, an error, right? So they're sitting in the access point and then the phone goes off and they are starting to try and understand. So they definitely was a period of time that they were not aware that they issued an error and, and it took them a couple minutes uh, to verify that. Uh, General Logan, when, when he got the alert, uh, called PACOM because he understands what the explicit process is uh, to verify whether there was in fact an, a launch or not. And obviously he went through his protocol and confirmed that, uh, that there were, was no launch. And then he responded to uh, the people that he, he called me, he called others to inform them that yes, in fact, the alert was an error. Uh, and we be began the process to inform the public. So her, your we own employee didn't realize that they had triggered this mistake until they received the mass communication on their mobile device? No. Uh, uh, primarily, yes. Did so you ask him why he said, yes, I really want to do this? Oh. Was it? They just... You, you ask someone, why did you make a mistake? I mean, it was not intentional, it was a mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, asking him, 
why he made a mistake. I'm not, I'm not sure what his answer is, but he made a mistake. He, he knows that. Yeah. So okay. if we can talk about now the safeguards that are in place to, again, work toward building back the integrity and trust that your department clearly needs in an island state where yes. we do face real danger, not just from the possibility of a ballistic missile, but a tsunami, a hurricane, so many other things that we have to be more readily prepared for right. than other communities. What are the now safeguards in place, clearly, to prevent a potential mistake from happening again? So a couple things. We have um, uh, suspended the, the tests, so the routine uh, activities will be suspended until we can uh, implement appropriate changes. As I said, uh, we've already implemented some of the changes to uh, ensure that more than one person is involved with that. Uh, we definitely learned that some of the um, notification some of the sirens did not work uh, and we need to uh, understand what uh, that is you know on a going forward basis we do intend to continue the monthly siren test and other tests as we as we uh, have done in the past you know we believe that it's in imperative that we uh, continue to exercise uh, the alert system uh, we recognize that this false alarm uh, is a terrible thing to happen uh, and we have implemented changes already uh, to assure that it doesn't happen again. Uh, we will further refine the processes um, as we go forward uh, to make sure that we can put in uh, better safeguards uh, to uh, prohibit this from happening. And How many personnel does it take to run the 24-7 operation? Well, right now we have, uh, for the, the manning that we have here is about three to four people uh, eight, eight hour, in eight-hour shifts. Any plans around. to make that additional additional staffing or <coughs> maybe even look at fatigue as part of the problem? Uh, not at this time. With three to three to four personnel is is pretty substantial for us. Is there a plan to put more messaging than just shelter in place in that initial warning message? A lot of people have said that there was a lack of information in that initial message and for those who may not have heard the other information or been to public yeah. hearings. Is there a way to include more information in that initial message that goes out? We'll, we'll take a look at that. But again, there's a limit on the number of spaces that we put in that message. And that what we've done over the past months is to uh, coordinate that message with Pacific Command as far as what data that we can put in from them and as what guidance we can put out. Again, it's getting ahead of it. If you're going to re rely on guidance on that one message, that's not enough. You have to get ahead of it uh, and and go to our website and see what our guidance is in the past because th that gives you a pretty, pretty good idea of what to do. and what. So there are people that travel here and will not get those briefings and not know to be aware of that kind of knowledge. Is there any plan to make them aware of that possibility? Yes. But working, you know, when, when we say protect, it's, it's the public and the visitors. But the George, is, George is here. We work with uh, Hawaii Tourism uh, Agency and work to get this message out to the, to the, the visitors also. It, we did. As soon as we got the messaging, we reached out to all the stakeholders, booked him very early. The, the Gip, Mr. Gibson from the Hilton Hawaiian Village, for example, called him very early. And they already had an action plan in place, and they notified all of the visitors. All the hotels did that. As I, as I mentioned earlier, it's always, I mean, uh, not we're, we're an island, so we're always preparing for some type of disaster, and the hotels take this very, very seriously, as well as the activities people, and making sure that not only the visitors are safe, but the residents as well that work in Waikiki. So when the alert is issued, then the hotels do notify all the visitors, all their guests, of what they need to do. Absolutely. Shelter in place, as well as everything else. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they, talk, and they talk to each other. How do you notify the guests? Just curious. Like within that time frame of say 12 minutes from when you get that initial notification, how would you say notify the guests? Uh, I would have to talk to, to, to them specifically, but they told me, they reassured me. I mean, they had a drill in place even when I talked to Jerry about the, not only the, the uh, employees, but all the residents getting down into shelters and what have you. So they have an action plan in place. Don't know the, the exact Since time. Since this was a mistake, do you worry about the hit that this can take potentially? Um, as I said, we're very, very concerned this even happened, but we're confident with all the dialogue that's going to be going on, won't happen again. But sure, our stakeholders were very, very concerned about that. But it's just too early to tell what, what kind of collateral damage this might be on it. That's why we're in conversations already all morning with our global partners, uh, just reassuring them that this was, this was a mistake, it won't happen again, and that we are open for business.
Well, and I don't know if you're the best person for this question, but if this was the real deal, how would this have happened? PATCOM would have been alerted that a ballistic <coughs> missile is incoming, and they contact you. Can you walk me through sure. that process? And also, more specifically, how much time we legitimately have if this was actually happening? Okay, the, the, work, the things that we've worked out to, to give the public as much warning and prep time as possible, we're talking about only a 20-minute launch to impact time from North Korea, just 20 minutes, okay? PACOM and the military needs about five minutes to characterize the launch. In other words, is it going Guam? Is it going Hawaii? Is it going over us? So they need that five minutes. Within that five, uh, five minutes, there is what is called missile event conference. PACOM is in there, DHS, FEMA is in there. Once they make a determination that it's inbound and Hawaii is in danger, we will get messages here at the state warning point from PACOM and NORAD or from FEMA's uh, emergency system. And based on that notification, our warning point personnel have the authority to go ahead and push the button. They don't have to call me, or the governor, or the tag. They have the authority to go push the button so that we can compress the timeline that our people have as much as possible. And that's the process right now. If you know that it was an internal error, why was it necessary to get FEMA's authorization first to send out the cancellation? Well, there is a, there is a process whereby the WEA, the, the Wireless Emergency Alert System, it's something that is not allowed to be tested. You know, the, the cell phone, we can't issue a test every month like we do for the sirens. So for us to use that, we had to clear that to make sure that we could get that out. And one of our personal, Ryan, Ryan Hirai on the IT side, get, got the approval and we got it out as soon as we could. We will work on that to make sure that we can get that out right away. Sounds like right now it's way too easy to send something out of, of the initial test, but <laughs> There are way, there's just way too much <coughs> in terms of, of getting it, exactly. getting the return. So this put things in our face that we have to fix, and that's what we're going to be doing. Just to make sure there, there, there isn't the possibility that, that the system got hacked in any way, which is why this happened. Well, I think uh, that, that was clarified. Wait, yeah. It, yeah. There, it, there definitely was no hacking involved. It was human error. Vern, as head of the... Hawaii Emergency Management Agency, and you've been doing these workshops and getting the word out, um, and with PSAs. What are the most what are the most important lessons you personally learned from what happened today? Well, from today, I think the most important things that we learn is how we stop this from ever happening again, and that I kind of uh, gave you some of the process that we're doing. But I think the the other thing is what we've learned from this. The questions that was brought out about what to do, all of that has to be emphasized again because we have such a short time. This idea of a shelter in place, having a plan ahead of time, knowing where you're going to go ahead of time, where to go, what to do, when to do it, that has to be done for all hazards, for all of our folks. You know, you asked the question about tsunamis and uh, hurricanes, what about the other hazards? Okay, this doesn't apply to that as far as the, the timeline. But again, know where to go, know what to do, know when to do it. Have a plan for yourself and your families for all times of the day. For all hazards, not just for this kind of kicks it up a bit, but again for hurricanes, tsunamis, same thing, get ahead of it. Each individual should have a plan. If you don't mind, then um, if you can go through this template again of being able to cancel an alert, make sure that most people get it, that, that this, this cancellation. Yeah. Can you go through that, please? Again, the, the, what the template will have, it, it'll be a pre-scripted message saying this is a false alarm. I don't have the wording right now, but this is what went out 38 minutes later. But it will it will specify that this is a false alarm. A missile is not inbound. That's a cat for the cancellation. And how will that, it will go out? It'll go out the same way the initial announcement went out about the, about the incoming, the warning. It'll go the same way and say that was a mistake and that was this is a cancellation of that. But how do you get it out faster than what happened today? It'll be a template within the screen and they can just push that. We need to so work I the think process. part of it uh, is that we didn't have a process in place to send a, uh, a message. Uh, we didn't have a message scripted that said this is a false alarm. You know, we were not prepared uh, for that. The fact that um, um, an alert was issued, that was incorrect. So we have built that now, and so clearly, uh, just as there's a button to initiate the alerts, there now is a button to initiate the cancellation. But it now we will continue. 
the, the we will continue to to evaluate and uh, strengthen that process. Um, you know, part of that was uh, we were uh, going through. Uh, there was no automatic process to initiate um, the fact that it was a false alarm. So we went through um, the processes to inform the media, social media, and all of that uh, manually because it was not um, automated prior to today's activity. Can you clarify moving forward for the future what exactly shelter in place means? I mean, given the fact that most people don't have a basement or shelter within their own homes or even workplaces, what exactly would you like individuals to do? Okay, let's take the, the, the missile event. Okay, like I said, shelter in place is something that we use a lot. The, the schools use a shelter in place if there's a, a active shooter or that kind of event, shelter. But the point is, shelter in place means you don't have time to go look for a, a designated shelter or so on. So shelter in place, like I said in the beginning, is for this event, you're looking for concrete, you're looking for uh, rocks, bricks, and so on. So, so you should have in ahead of time where that shelter in place is. You won't have time to get up, pick up your family, call your loved ones, get your car, pick them up, and go to a shelter. Shelter in place, in place means you have to take care of yourself and shelter in the best place that you can. It means in this particular case, if the threat were a ballistic missile, or a ballistic missile that you need to be inside. That's so correct. if you're out at Ala Moana Beach Park, run to the bathroom? Any place that you can get inside, because this thing about get inside, stay inside, and stay tuned will save lives. So it doesn't matter how far up you are. It doesn't matter if the structure is an old single plywood home so long as you're inside a building, and that's meant to protect you from radiation? Right. The first part, again, is the shelters that we talk about, is, they are not blast shelters. And we're talking fallout shelters. It is what it is. Where you are at that point in time, you can't change that. If you're in a single, single, uh, single family home and no basement, you gotta just get to the center of that. If you're in an apartment building, you wanna get away from the fallout where the, it'll settle, get to the bottom of the building, into the basement if possible get closest to the center of the building. And that's the kind of, that's all we can do. Uh, that's all you can do. And the, and, the, and the farther away you get from the radiation and the longer it, it decays very rapidly. So if you can do that, that's the best you can do. You had mentioned that's all the 13 minute window to respond if there is a, a, a real threat. Uh, what would happen if there's a real threat? Do we just look for that emergency alert and there's only gonna be one message saying that there's an incoming ballistic missile? Then you have three sources of notification. One is the wireless emergency alert system, the cell phones. Then we have the EAS, which is the emergency alert system, television, radio, interrupt the broadcast, then you see the message. And the, the last resort is the sirens. If you hear the wailing attacks, uh, attack tone siren, that's your last notification. We have three methods and that's all we have right now. So if we get that emergency alert and you turn on the television and you're not getting that screen on the bottom saying that this is a, a real situation, you can assume that there's some kind of error? Well, if you, if, how, how do you, what made you turn on your TV? If you get that emergency alert like you did today. Uh, on your, on your smartphone? I'd use that. So. You don't have time to look for a TV and turn it on. What he's saying is it's supposed to happen simultaneously. <coughs> that's, that's correct. Right, so it's, if you don't see the alert on TV, but you got the message, you have to assume that it's an that's error. Correct. Well, if, <laughs> if, I, if you have it on your phone, and if it's not a test day, I would use that. This might be a basic question, but why doesn't PACCOM, why aren't they, as, as the ones who can verify and track the launches and such, why aren't they the ones issuing the alert? Why is there this two-tier system that opens us up to this potential error? I do think that PACCOM would have a whole lot more important things to worry about. Um, you know, I, I think that they are definitely, PACCOM has their mission to keep the country and, and all of the people safe. You know, civil defense here in Hawaii uh, has the responsibility to inform our people and keep them safe. So we, we definitely uh, have lots of conversations that go back between PACOM and um, Hawaii Civil Defense. You know, we share a lot of information. Uh, we are in contact with them all the time. Um, and certainly, uh, we do believe that um, state civil defense and county civil defense, for that matter, are the appropriate um, individuals to inform our, our greater constituencies. Can't PACOM serve sort of as a, as a backup system in the sense that if, if it's, it is a false alarm, then being able to just say it is a false alarm? 
So they would be able to notify the people on their bases that it would be a false alarm. And uh, that's what the call was this morning immediately to find out, one, there was no missile threat. So I immediately, because I didn't hear a siren, when I saw the alert system, I immediately thought something is wrong. So I called in over here to validate that. And then I called PACOM to, uh, to get a second opinion that there was no inbound missile so that when I let the governor know I can have him the, all the facts and provide him the, the utmost information as immediately as possible. Um, adding PACOM into this mix, th that's not their, really their role. Their role is, is looking outward, to, as the governor says, to protect the nation and our friends and allies in the Pacific area. So the, the state of Hawaii, while they are concerned about the state of Hawaii because their people live here, uh, they have access to the, and information control within the bases. But it's civilian rule over military authority. PICOM still has to answer to the President of the United States. They can't act on their own. Right, but this, this was, if you remember, this was an internal test that was internally generated by the state warning point through HIEMA. PICOM had nothing to do with this uh, other than the fact that if a real world event happens, they are informing us of what happens. Governor is responsible for the state of Hawaii and all the people within the state of Hawaii as we are, and, we, and it's our job to notify. I'm sorry, you said earlier you said the internal test that you did, was it this monthly also, or is it just weekly, or how is that? Working? This is an occasional internal checklist, as, as General Miyagi routine. said, it, routine. Uh, that routine. routine test that the Internally. change of shift works to, to go through their checklist to make sure they understand the protocols. Okay, not every shift, but routine. Yes. Every, okay. every few weeks. Uh, it, it, it's up to the warning point and our ops chief about when they do this, but it's been routine. We've been doing this since about November of last year, and we, this is the first time we've had this problem. And every shift change, you see? Not every shift change. It's on a routine basis, but not. it's not a direct and scheduled thing. Okay. When they push the other button, not the real deal button, when they push that test button, <coughs> where does that go? What happens? It's the same thing that we do every December, uh, every workday. The beginning, beginning of the work, day. there's a siren that's done that. But on this button, what it is on the on the ballistic missile side, you're talking about the test now. Okay, I stand correct. This is not the sirens. This is just the EA, EAS and WEA system. It goes out and it, that's it. It stays internally within this building. It doesn't go out. It doesn't come to my phone. Doesn't come to Vern's phone or the governor's phone. That this is a test. It's just an internal system test that's done through a checklist it, within this building. It should not have gone out. It goes we because we want we want the state warning point people to 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 walk through the checklist to be able to do this in a timely fashion in the event it really happens, so that the 1.4 million people that are in the state of Hawaii are aware of and can react to a real incoming missile. That's why, and you only have 15 minutes plus or minus to do that. So we we have to make sure that our people are are are, are well versed in in the checklist. It, and we've been doing this for months. It just so happened today. Instead of the person individually hitting the test button, they accidentally hit the real button. How do you quantify of the 1.4 million people who live here in Hawaii, who actually did receive this and who didn't in the event that it is a real emergency? We have to, working through the counties, the counties have some idea of as far as who got the notification. We got all these calls. So we're, we're, we're documenting that also. <coughs> this thing about the, the two different cell phone carriers, yeah, we got calls on that already. So we need to meet with them to get, verify what the situation is with each, each carrier. So that's going to be working on. We know, though, that the most vulnerable of our communities, right, the elderly, the homeless, those who are less fortunate, they may not have access to the kind of technology that would have provided this alert via phone, via TV yes. broadcast. And what if they live in one of those communities where a siren is or isn't working as well? What is the plan for that? Again, okay, the plan is on our website, in our public outreach. Again, this is family resilience. This is individual resilience. It's people taking care of each other and their kapuna. Or, or the, the people that, they, they have to work this out. Uh, I, we've had, I've had personal comments about, I, I live by myself in a, in a family home. There's nobody there. We have to work to the community so the communities can identify where these needs are and take care of each other. We have the CERT program, the Community Emergency Response Team program, the HARP program, where communities step up and take care of each other within the communities. That's the only way we can do this. 
It's people working together like we do in lava, like we do in Hurricane Iniki. That's the only way we can do this. In a real situation, would you be sending multiple emergency alert texts? In a real emergency? Yes. I think uh, that alert system would continue on for about an hour. But then, as soon as the, the all clear or the, it's determined that there is no threat, then we will go on AM, FM rate or the same, the same methods of communication to, to let everybody know that there is no, it's all clear. And how about the, the emergency text? Would you send only one or is there going to be No, there will be a follow-up if there is no threat. If there is a real threat? If there is a real... More than one text message if it's a real threat? Yes. Will be every minute you're going to send an update? For uh, them? As long as we have any information from, from Pacific Command that there is a threat, that message will be outgoing. Fern, when you said this person made a mistake, on that test, he hit the real button instead of test, does it say like test, ballistic missile, real ballistic missile, test hurricane, real no. hurricane? No. no. What does it say? It's for this one, well, I, I can't give you, it's, it's the actual, and this is the test. If you want the exact wording, I could give you, but act, there's a des des designation between the two. Actual button and test. Yes. But I mean, the difference between a, a ballistic missile versus a hurricane. Well, hurricane is different because That's it's a steady tone. It's a steady tone. Uh -huh. And th but, but you were doing it on ballistic today. <coughs> That's correct. Only, okay. Yes. And, and just to let all of you know, and to, to help <coughs> ease the mind of the, of the public that we apologize for what happened today. But we are going to do a thorough investigation. We'll put that report together uh, and, and, and Vernon and, and myself and the governor will we'll get this information out to you so you all know exactly what happened so we can answer all the questions. We have a good idea what happened. Uh, we're very well uh, aware of already making changes as the governor has, has directed us to do. Uh, and so we're, we're getting way ahead of this uh, uh, as far as uh, the, the future of this ever happening again. Uh, we, we are confident that this will not happen again. Uh, and, and we will work towards that and we'll get this report out to all of you that I think you deserve. I do have two more questions if possible. If this had happened on a Monday through Friday basis, what would have happened within the school system alert process? And also, what is the protocol that the airport is supposed to follow? Because we're hearing reports of individuals being deplaned off airlines. We're hearing that pilots circled and didn't land. Can you clarify what should or would happen if this were the real deal? I, I think we're still working through all the information as to the actual thing, the events that did occur uh, as far as the when the notice went out. I do know that I had contact with security personnel at the airport. Uh, and we did talk to them and get the word out. I know the Honolulu Police Department immediately at about 8.10 called into the state warning point this morning, got validation that it was uh, a false alarm, and they put that out to their officers who went out on PA systems throughout the city and county of Honolulu to get that information out to the public as much as they could with the, the time that they had. And so there was a lot of things happening behind the scenes, knowing that this was a false alarm to get that out there. So, but that's part of our investigation, is to find out everything that happened, and then how do we ensure that we can put fixes in to make sure those things don't happen. But I, it, it appears that people did react to, to what the message said. And, and unfortunately, this is a false alarm. Um, and we did have people that took action, which is exactly what we're asking them to do, and, and not look at this as a mistake. We're not going to trust anybody again, but that they take action when, when in fact they're directed to. Did the military deploy any jets at all from this? Not to my knowledge, they did not. Because they had, like I said, PACOM, they, they didn't have any information that there was an incoming missile. So they, they, once they talked with me, they knew that this was a false alarm. What was the atmosphere like inside the room where this took place? How many people were there? And once it became apparent what had happened, was it, you know, was it frantic? Was it, can you give a sense of how that, that played out? Well, there was deep concern, let me put that. They were trying to get all these calls answered, and they were passing out information uh, to myself, to the to Joe Logan, and the governor to make sure that we could. They were frantically working, trying to get this message, the cancellation message out. Okay. We can take maybe another question, and then we have to get back to work. I'm sorry. Bottom line, what is it that you'd like to say to the people and also visitors of Hawaii? You know, we are sorry that this um, uh, false alarm had occurred. Uh, we are committed uh, to ensure that it never happens again. We have already taken action uh, to minimize uh, that possibility. 
uh, by suspending the, the test uh, and already implemented a process to ensure that at least two people are involved uh, with that process uh, and we are committed to um, ensure that uh, the public uh, is notified uh, when there is an emergency uh, and we are working very hard to assure that they are never again uh, given a false alarm. Thanks everybody. <coughs>